Um, unlike Lisa Emerson's talk, which was funny, mine's going to be pretty dry. I'm going to blame it on the dehydrating effects of salt. <laughs> um, salt is such a huge topic, and I really only could talk about a tiny fraction of the things that one could imagine talking about with salt. And in fact, the one thing that I promised to talk about here, um, how much salt do we really need, was really kind of an overpromise, and I'm very sorry. <laughs> I can't possibly tell you that. Um, but what I will talk about is ways that I see that different dietary contexts can affect your salt needs, and then uh, you can maybe apply that to your own individual situation. So the reason that I became interested in this topic at all is because this growing difference that I was noticing between the ketogenic diet culture and the carnivore diet culture. So old school carnivore dieters uh, like myself mostly actually avoid adding salt to our diets. We, we eat animal foods, few if any plants, and um, for most of us we don't even add any salt to our food, which is different from maybe um, more recent versions of the carnivore diet you might have heard, which say meat, salt, and water. That is, that's not the old school. Um, on the ketogenic diet, on the other hand, a lot of people are recommending eating very high amounts of salt, and lots of people swear by it and, and, and f actually feel better, and so I have um, no uh, dispute with that, but it made me very curious about whether some of the, these differences that we're seeing had some dietary origins, and that's what I want to explore. So I'm going to first briefly talk about this progression of claims that we've been seeing about salt that, that's really tied to the Western diet and doesn't necessarily have anything to do with any of our concerns here, and then claims that are more relevant to the sort of paleo uh, ethos and talk about salt intake in humans across time and space, and then talk more about what claims are being made in the ketogenic diet space and how a ketogenic diet might affect, affect salt needs, and then uh, go on to the carnivore diet and how plant eating might affect salt needs. So <laughs> salt intake and the safety and healthfulness of it is controversial even in the conventional medical, mainstream medical world and has been for a really long time. But the focus of the controversy has been between whether it's detrimental or whether it's just neutral. And so it's quite interesting for the ketogenic diet community in particular to be now arguing that it's in fact beneficial or even necessary to eat high amounts of salt. So we've kind of opened the spectrum of what we're talking about and it shifts the burden of proof somewhat um, and it kind of opens the Overton window of what's possible to even consider. Um, so we have this kind of hypnotizing pendulum going on um, from somehow in recognizing the error of the position on the left that you must decrease your salt intake. We've now zoomed past the middle and are arguing for the right. And I'm going to try to argue that the right is also wrong. So the left side of the pendulum has mostly been about blood pressure, salt's effect on blood pressure. Um, I'm actually not going to go very deep on there because a lot of people have already written about it in depth, but just as an overview of what's at stake, high blood pressure is one of the main defining features of metabolic syndrome. So we know that blood pressure is, is something undesirable. And we do know that lowering salt can slightly lower your blood pressure and maybe more if you're particularly salt sensitive. But salt doesn't cause metabolic syndrome, and if you, you lower salt, it doesn't solve your metabolic syndrome. If you want to solve metabolic syndrome, you need to do something different. Um, so one of the people who wrote about this was Adele Haidt, uh, whom we lost this year. And I just want to take a moment to honor her memory. Um, she made this really funny Facebook post in 2015, hello, it's meat. And she had a really great sense of humor and a piercing sardonic wit and an exceptional capacity for nuance, and she'll be very missed. Um, I like to imagine she could be saying hello from the other side. So as part of her investigations into the nutritional guidelines, she wrote a couple of posts on the topic of nutritional guidelines aimed at reducing salt intake. And one of her criticisms about, is about the methodology, which I agree with her quite a bit. Uh, once a food item becomes a target of this kind of policy, the evidence after that point seems to not really matter how much sense it makes, as long as it's consistent with the recommendation that's already in place. 
Um, so once you've decided that salt being related to blood pressure is um, somehow actually causal of metabolic syndrome, and you put that idea into policy, then the gymnastics start. So we have this beautiful example here um, that's actually used to talk about why salt is causing the obesity crisis. So we have this dubious looking linear encapsulation of the relationship between salt intake and fluid consumption, which actually, there's a long history of that belief, but it now seems to be not true, and I'll talk about it a bit later, um, but it doesn't, certainly doesn't look linear to me. But I'm going to actually read what they say in this article because it, it's just so, ex so um, insane. <laughs> uh, whilst salt is not a direct cause of obesity, it is a major influencing factor through its effect on soft drink consumption. Salt makes you thirsty and increases the amount of fluid you drink. 31% of the fluid drunk by 4 to 18-year-olds is sugary soft drinks, which have been shown to be related to childhood obesity. Reducing salt intake could therefore be important in reversing the current trend of increasing childhood obesity. So there you go. Salt causes obesity. <laughs> um, okay, so... I don't think we really need to argue too much more about that, at least in this community, but a very influential book that has had impact in this community came out about five years ago that made a swath of claims in an attempt to support its thesis, which is that not only is salt not harmful, but it's actually harmful not to eat it. Um, so examples of the claims, um, and I'm not going to address most of them, uh, include, for example, that a low salt diet increases insulin and thereby can cause insulin re resistance. Um, that because a low-salt diet activates the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, this could lead to heart failure and kidney disease. And uh, it reduces sex drive and fertility, increases erectile dysfunction, sleep problems, etc. cetera. Um, and then um, because, if you think about that, it wouldn't be very evolutionarily consistent if we had a low-salt diet in the past um, and it was causing all these problems to not get a very high amount of salt, right? So it all kind of hinges on this other claim that the book starts with, that despite the majority of scientists believing that our evolutionary ancestors evolved on a low-salt diet, uh, the author claims that we actually evolved on a, on a high-salt diet. So the, these claims have actually been uh, addressed extensively elsewhere, and you can read some critical reviews here. The first one here is a fairly quick and actually quite decimating, I think, look at the quality of evidence that you, that's used specifically in trying to make that claim that we evolved on a high salt diet. Um, that's from Matthew Dalby, who I know through this community, actually. Um, the second one is a, an extensive set of counterarguments to many of the other claims throughout the book. And I actually don't think I agree with all of the counterarguments. But that article uh, is, it, provides an amazing bank of studies. So if you wanted to look into any of those specific claims and see how, um, uh, where the evidence lies, you could look and see like all the for and against for it that the person has put together. So I'm leaving that for an interested reader. But because all of, the, all of these claims are not diet specific, they're all tied to the Western diet, it kind of makes it irrelevant, especially since a lot of the evidence has to do with either epidemiology or other kinds of observations in people eating a grain-based diet. And so it, it may not, even if the claims are true, it may not be transferable to what we are caring about. So I, I want to just step back and look a little bit about the history and geography of salt intake across humans. Um, it's definitely the case that in Neolithic times, post-agriculture, salt became very, very important. There was an extensive salt trade. I think taste was probably a part of it. I mean, other things like spices and luxuries were traded extensively, but I also think that a great deal of its importance was for preservation as a kind of alternative to fermentation, which would have been the main preservation before that. So it's a huge new technology that was very, very valuable. However, um, Beyond the agricultural world, even in current times, if you look at uh, other societies that are not agricultural, and here I've just selected a few examples of, of specific peoples that have been studied uh, by various authors over the past uh, 50 or more years. Um, if you look 
at all of them, their salt intake was actually very low, ranging from almost nothing through a couple of grams of sodium a day, so in any case, much lower than uh, what we're eating now, and to no apparent detriment. Um, and this is carbohydrate um, agnostic. So some of these societies were eating almost nothing but starchy carbs and others almost nothing but meat. And so just uh, an example of the very, very low sodium um, from this study, this was actually a study uh, about the flora and fauna in a particular region and how those animals and organisms were adapting to the low salt. But of course, if you go up the food chain, the people who lived there also had very low salt as a consequence. And he says that the Highland Papuan consumes 200 to 400 times more potassium than sodium. And to give you a, a sort of reference for that, uh, a typical wild carnivore would eat 20 to 1 potassium to sodium, and a, an herbivore would be something, uh, sorry, 5 to 1 and 20 to 1 for herbivores. So this is much, much bigger than that, and the absolute amounts less than one, less than 0.1 gram per day. And uh, they had aldosterone levels which were consistent with what we would consider, or what they would have considered sodium deficiency at the time. Now, aldosterone comes into place to into play to uh, conserve sodium in the body. And so this looked to them like it could be possibly dangerous, but whether it's actually dangerous is kind of a point of contention. Um, in fact, um, we saw earlier that De Nicola Antonio was claiming that it could cause heart attacks to have aldosterone that high, and when we look at the stance in the ketogenic diet community, it's thought to be causing symptoms that might explain people's belief that uh, a ketogenic diet causes uh, quote-unquote adrenal fatigue. Um, on the other hand, there are reviews like this. So this is a review about the effects of low-salt diets. It's much more recent, 2010, and the author is looking at all the physiology, and he concludes that, um, that, it, that it seems like the sodium restriction is, is making uh, changes in adrenocortical function relative only to salt-retaining hormones. So it's increasing the production of aldosterone, but the available evidence does not suggest that this is associated with diminution in other adrenocortical function, and it follows that the ability to withstand stress should in no way be diminished by a decrease in the present general levels of salt ingestion. So in other words, his view is that the function of aldosterone is specific to maintaining salt balance, and it's just normal in a low-salt context. And what I think these ethnographic studies show is that a low-salt diet is normal. So in, if a low-salt diet is normal, then maybe a high, higher aldosterone level is also normal. Um, and if we look at what people have estimated pre-agricultural sodium intake, it's also quite low. Uh, one person has estimated it below a gram per day. And Cordain and colleagues say that there's there's minimal or no evolutionary precedent in hominin species before the Neolithic period of this 10 gram per day level of high salt consumption. So let's look at salt needs on ketogenic diets. Um, Verda Health, where Stephen Finney and Jeff Volick are advocating for and educating about nutritional ketosis, which they have done for a very long time, do advocate for salt especially for keto adaptation, which is a relatively short period, but then ongoing in an ongoing way for nutritional ketosis as well. And they make this interesting claim that I alluded to before that um, these symptoms that some people report when they're not feeling well on a ketogenic diet and they call it adrenal fatigue are exactly the symptoms that you would expect if you had a sodium deficiency. Um, but they argue, they argue this on two premises, and the first one I'm, I'm not really enthusiastic about it. It's, it's an epidemiological argument, so they have this chart showing uh, mort a mortality curve based on um, salt excretion from, the, from a certain day, and then um, based on that, in a grain-based population, they say that five grams, which is what they recommend, is the sweet spot for salt intake. But I just, I don't find it very compelling because I don't think that we, that this kind of information can tell you anything about what's best on a ketogenic diet, even if it is relevant to a grain-based diet. But what's a bit more persuasive to, to me is their um, talk about the naturesis of fasting, that's um, sodium urine excretion. Um, there's a long history of literature on that uh, from fasting, which translates somewhat to the ketogenic diet. And so I'm just going to 
point to a couple of um, landmark studies along the way of the topic and things that they pointed out that are informative. So there's this very early study, one of the earliest in 1960. Um, they're looking at here a comparison between the sodium excretion during a four-day fast compared to four days of a very low-sodium diet. The low-sodium diet is the very steep one where the excretion is very high at first, um, which is kind of counterintuitive, um, and, but then it drops off very quickly. Whereas on, with fasting, it starts out about the same, also very, very high, and drops off a little more slowly. Um, the reason that they were looking at this actually wasn't so much to compare it to the low-salt diet, although they knew that was of interest. Um, but it's because they had noticed, people had noticed that when you go, when you fast, you lose an enormous amount of weight at the very beginning. And we all know now that that's water weight. But one of the reasons that we know that is from studies like this. Um, and, and what he says, basically, in the discussion is that the weight, this weight loss happened even though people were drinking as much water as they needed. So it's not altering some kind of normal mechanism um, for maintaining isotonicity of the body fluids. That means for the, the keeping the concentration of salt and water in the extracellular fluid that has to be kept in a fairly tight range. Um, he says, it seems likely that the changes in fasting would be of such a nature so, as to provide the optimum physiologic adaptation to this metabolic state. So in other words, he's saying that um, we're, we're excreting salt so that we can get to the level that is more appropriate for this particular condition. We're not losing salt that we, that we actually needed. Um, and he goes on to say that maybe in our modern context, with so much salt availability, we have this great excess, and the excretion is just a kind of reset to what our extracellular fluid is supposed to be under that different state. Um, here's another study that I think is really interesting, because what they've done in this case is they've done, it's just three days of fasting again, but they've done different levels of sodium intake. And so they're kind of trying to make up for the excretion. So they have uh, 50 milliequivalents and 100 milliequivalents. 100 milliequivalents is a two and, about two and a half grams of sodium, a little less. So it's like a teaspoon of salt. Um, and, and what you see is that over time, over, the, over three days, the excretion goes to match and exceed what's being given. So if you're given 100, you excrete 140. If you're given 50, you excrete 100. If you're given none, you excrete 40. And so the balance seems to maintain around this negative level. Um, and so it seems like we're kind of chasing an excretion, and it doesn't, it doesn't really benefit you to try to add more. Um, here is a study w where it shows what happens if you let this go on longer. And it looks like it takes about a week for that high level of excretion to stop, and then you go into approximate balance. You still need a little because you still will need some sodium uh, replacement, even no matter what condition you're in. So uh, the balance isn't completely zero, but it, it, it settles out. Uh, and I think that supports the idea that in an ongoing situation, the body can adjust to these lower sodium levels. Um, and then there are studies showing uh, what happens when you try to add back food. So in this one, um, the two bars, one's sodium and one's potassium, and the dotted line that's higher is the sodium intake that they were given. And so we've got control as before the fast, and then an average of what happens over three days of fast, and then refeeding with 600 calories of various macronutrients. So if you eat carbohydrates after that fast, you'll immediately go into positive um, salt balance. And, and in fact, uh, it's not shown here, but that positive balance goes way higher than normal so that you're retaining a lot, which can possibly be a problem for some people. In, when they added protein back, it went to almost neutral. And when they added fat, so it made it even more ketogenic, but without any actual um, protein or carbohydrate or ability to <laughs> add carbohydrates, um, it, it, the excretion went even higher. And then just another example of that, we've got a five-day fast where you can see that the peak excretion has already been hit and is starting to come down. And then when they add protein, it just goes right into positive sodium balance. And so th that can maybe shed light on what would happen if you were in the context of an actual ketogenic diet and not just fasting, which is obviously a bit different. Um, and again, so this, this sentiment gets repeated. Uh, the, uh, these authors say 
the natriuretic stimulus of fasting can be a profound one, and it continues until an appreciable degree of contraction of the effective extracellular fluid volume occurs. And after this initial phase of naturesis, avid sodium retention is the rule. Um, so maybe there's just an excess sodium required to support all that fluid that's not present in the fasted state. Uh, so, so the story looks like this. You, you start a ketogenic diet, and that leads to a release of extracellular fluid and a negative sodium balance despite intake, uh, regardless of what you do, um, until you reach a new um, balance level. And the standard of care says to respond to that acutely with supplementation. And as far as I can tell, that the excretion is just going to exceed it. Um, OK. So I also just want to point out from an evolutionary perspective, we're talking about a very old conserved metabolic state that originally was an adaptation for lack of access to food. And I would think that when you have lack of access to food, you also have lack of access to water and almost certainly little to no sodium at all. So if you believe that humans and prehumans were fairly frequently entering ketosis for millions of years, then it would seem strange that a sodium excretion here is a mistake that we need to correct. Now, it could simply be that it was a necessary cost and that um, fixing it is actually better than not fixing it, um, but it's not necessary. We, it's hard to tell. Um, all of this is very connected to water needs. So this is a graph from Cahill, who was an early study of fasting, and he is uh, pointing out that when you fast, your urea generation goes way, way down. This is not necessarily true if you're eating protein. Um, but because of that, you don't need very much water to excrete it. And you can, he says you can, your urine volume can fall to 200 milliliters per day. But there's a second component here, and that's that when you're eating that or consuming, when you're metabolizing, let's say, from either food or from your own body stores that much fat, you're also beginning to actually produce a, a significant amount of your own water. Um, so... Let's look at uh, metabolic water a little bit more. So <laughs> despite what you may have heard, when we metabolize fat, we don't turn it into energy in a sort of matter into energy sense, right? There is an, there is an ATP byproduct, but the mass itself gets transformed into carbon dioxide and water. And we, we never talk about that usually because all we care about is calories and water and carbon dioxide don't have any calories, so why would we even talk about that? But uh, we do get water out, and that's pretty significant if you're eating or losing from your body, say, 200 grams of fat a day, which is quite plausible in a ketogenic or fasting um, situation, that's, that's your 200 milliliters right there because a gram of fat will give you a gram of water, approximately. If you're eating protein, you might need more than that. Um, so it turns out that it's not just the case that burning fat can meet some of your water needs, but actually having water needs can cause you to increase your fat burning for the purpose of generating water. And I know two ways in which that can happen. Um, first uh, is not drinking. <laughs> so <laughs> there's this really cool study with uh, birds, migrating birds, finches, who were fasted overnight with and without water. And the take home is that when they didn't give them water, they burned six times as much fat to make those water needs. So um, that might be one reason to uh, not drink water if you're, <laughs> if you're fasting and you're really interested in fat burning. But the, the other, oh, uh, and I wanted to mention that there are other animals that do make pretty much all of their uh, water needs are met through their own metabolic water in addition to the, whatever they get in their food. And that would include some desert animals and hibernating mammals and some marine mammals. Um, and the question comes, well, how much does that apply to humans? And it does, there is an interesting um, fact that it appears that humans have an adaptation for reduced water demands compared to other great apes. And that's a new, newish paper from Ponser and colleagues. Um, but the other, the other way that you can cause metabolic water uh, to be made is by consuming salt. So like I said earlier, it used to be thought that high salt intake drives thirst. Um, and that was thought for a really long time, and that was what was behind that soft drink claim. But that's now thought to be false. There was a really interesting paper that has many components to it that I would love to tell you all about, but I'm just going to tell you the one uh, part that's relevant here. And that's that they found out that giving people high salt intake 
it didn't cause them to drink more, but it caused them to uh, break down, like it caused a, a catabolic state with uh, cortisol and the breakdown, more breakdown of fat and um, protein that led to more metabolic water. So it causes water retention in various ways. Uh, and it, so this looks in many ways like water balance changes in keto adaptation and in dehydration. Um, so maybe that's also a reason to try to consume salt. So you can drive fat oxidation by um, playing with those osmolality needs to keep your salt concentration in balance. Um, to look at the other side, um, does, does drinking more water increase salt needs? It's not clear to me that it does because I think that we can regulate our excretion of water e equally well, uh, but there may be certain um, like athletic uh, situations. Tim Noakes has a whole book about this called Waterlogged in which uh, there can be a lot of danger from drinking a whole lot of water that's not properly salted in the athletic community. Um, and it's not from sweating because sweating is actually hypotonic. You, you sweat more water than you sweat salt, so it increases your salt concentration. So let me just quickly go on to the carnivore diet. Um, the, most, the two most important figures of the modern carnivore diet community were these two figures. Uh, one uh, is Willemar Stephenson. He was an Arctic explorer, and he stayed with the Inuit for six or seven years in aggregate and ate what they ate, and that included low salt, so he, was pretty, uh, he thought that that was pretty important. And Ausley Stanley, who is this eclectic uh, sound man for the Grateful Dead, LSD, cooker extraordinaire, ballet dancer, just really amazing guy. And he, uh, he ate a pure carnivore diet, of all things, for the last 50 years of his life. And he had certain things that he believed about it for whatever reasons. And he was adamant that salt should be avoided. And so those two people really influenced the culture that I cut my teeth on when I started the carnivore diet. And that's part of why uh, we didn't use salt. Um, so why might, why might that be? Um, we, we know that salt licks are something that herbivores go to and carnivores only go to to get the herbivores. Um, they don't really partake in it themselves. Uh, so what could, what could it be about plant eating or about meat eating? What, plants are very high in potassium, which can increase your sodium needs. Another thing that's not talked about very often is that Plants are full of secondary metabolites, anti-nutrients that need to be detoxified, and that can take sodium. So there's some evidence that animals that go to salt licks will go to them more often if they're eating plants that are really high in certain toxins. Um, and then the, on the meat side, meat has much more sodium than plants. So carnivores typically get all of their sodium needs met simply through the meat that they eat. Um, so for a carnivore dieter, we have those three reasons at the top, and then I also speculate that it possibly has to do with drinking less, because on, the, on a ketogenic diet, you're, you're often drinking sweetened drinks or some kind of, um, or you're encouraged to drink uh, high levels because you're dieting or something, and you don't really drink to thirst. You drink for the, for the reasons of pleasure or for reasons of belief and health needs. Whereas if you're on a diet where you're said, told to drink only water and drink it to thirst, you're much less likely to overdrink. So maybe that is a component. Um, what about people who just cry a lot? <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I, I can't tell you how much salt is optimal for you. I think there's a lot of individuality. I've seen some people who absolutely feel their best when they're eating a lot of salt. And I've also seen a lot of people who took salt out of their diet and suddenly feel way better than they ever felt before. Um, so all I can really do is point to these patterns and see if, if it's helpful somehow to figure out why, why those things might be true. And it's interesting to notice that the only two um, groups that I know of that have this high salt intake are this agricultural grain-based diet and the ketogenic diet, um, one for I don't know, historical reasons and the other, well, also for historical reasons. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, th these are the factors that I think might have something to do with it, water intake, plant intake, meat intake, and uh, culture. And so I hope that that's useful for your uh, own self-study. Thanks.
Thank you, that was a great presentation. Your conclusion seems spot on, especially given that thirst and sodium intake are so regulated at a very basic level, you would expect that the thirst for water and taste for sodium would be the ultimate determinant of someone's needs. I had one comment and one question. Um, so on, you showed each carbon generating one, accounting for one water molecule in metabolic oxidation, but that neglects the two water molecules that are consumed for each carbon in the complete beta oxidation of a fatty acid, which is a net loss of water. Um, so one water for each uh, acetyl-CoA generated in beta oxidation is consumed, and then three waters are consumed in the citric acid cycle. So I'm not sure that beta oxidation can actually account for that metabolic water. But my question is on these ethnographies. So I don't want to seem like I'm dissing ethnographers, but it seems like ethnographic research has its fair share of extremely sloppy, missed observations that sh seem obvious to those of us whose primary concerns are nutritional. So two things that come to mind are the people who estimated that the Hadza eat 150 grams of fiber a day because they neglected to note that they spit the fiber out into the dirt, and the people who estimated that the Simani eat 96% carbohydrate, uh, which is a high carbohydrate diet, but they only measured what they brought back to the camp and didn't measure anything that they were eating when they were out hunting. Um, and so earlier in this conference, uh, two, two days ago, I think, uh, Pedro Carrera Bastos noted that Stefan Lindenberg uh, noted that, the, that in their cooking water for their tubers, which is consistent with what you were saying about a high carbohydrate diet needing more sodium, they would include enough ocean water that they got 2.3 to 3 grams of sodium per day from it. And so, you know, what are the chances that these ethnographies have missed something like that? when they've been studying it. I, I wonder if you have any comments on that. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Those are excellent comments. So about the metabolic water, um, I admit I didn't check that work. That seems to be the standard answer when you look around. Um, I would counter that with the fact that uh, tissue, the adipose tissue might also have water in it that gets released when it's burned, but I don't know um, what the actual, if that calculation is, is actually off. Um, as to uh, <laughs> ethnography, you're, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, we Not only do we make mistakes, but we see what we want to see. Um, and so if low salt was considered some kind of panacea, then it would be natural for people to overlook sources. Um, so those, those are excellent points. Thank you. Hi, Amber. Hi. <laughs> um, Regarding the point that y you made that uh, um, sweat is uh, hypotonic, um, I'm a little confused at that point. If I understood you correctly, it would seem to turn a lot of sports uh, nutrition and hydration completely on its head. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. that actually, you know, if you're <laughs> ret retaining more salt than you are losing fluid, then, you know, replacing it with water would seem to be completely adequate. Right. Um, and so I thought that maybe the situation could be that, you, you know, we're, we, instead of talking about like uh, perhaps a, a purely a salt depletion or overabundance, you know, that maybe it is uh, more of a, um, that, that we're missing things like magnesium or potassium, or there's kind of just maybe an imbalance in the way that we feed ourselves uh, in, in uh, uh, modern diets. Right. So, yeah, I think you're absolutely right that the uh, whole industry is dependent on that belief. Um, that's partly what Tim Noakes' book is about. And um, there, there is a, a variance in the amount of sodium that's excreted in sweat, but it seems to be related to how much you take in in the same way that urine excretion is higher if you take in a lot. So, so if you say, well, you're, you're losing all this salt so you, in your sweat, so you have to replace it, that might actually just be a, a, a feedback of, with the wrong causality. But I've also seen some people point to genetic differences. And you're absolutely right, we lose all kinds of other things in sweat, like Lisa was mentioning that we lose iron in sweat. Um, so um, maybe more complex than, than I put it. 
Uh, but I do think that it, uh, it does have huge implications for our practices in endurance sports. And um, one of the things that Noakes points out is that persistence runners um, in societies that do that ha go to great pains to not use a lot of water on their runs because they c carrying it is a detriment. They need to be as light as possible. And combining that with the with noticing that humans seem to have this extra ability to need less water, um, it's kind of plausible to me that we're over drinking in our exercise. Right. Thank you, Amber. Good presentation. Thanks. Hey, Amber. Great talk. Thank you. Um, I have a question that I guess is kind of selfish because it's really for my own <laughs> benefit after this, but um, five grams. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, recently read a book from Rick Johnson at the University of Colorado, Why Our Nature Wants Us to Get Fat, or something yeah, along yeah. those lines. And he talks about this pathway, which I'm going to butcher, especially after following a question from Chris. But um, <laughs> I, he says something along the lines of, you know, if you have a high blood osmolality, that it's going to trigger this polyol pathway that's going to push glucose uh, and form uh, fructose, which might lead to, like, increases in obesity as well as uric acid, which might have the connection to blood pressure and stuff like that. So right, my exactly. selfish, selfish question is, I'm a guy who saunas or goes on a hike or something and I'll come home and rehydrate with like a, like a electrolyte package that has high sodium of some sort. And I'm wondering if that'll put me in a state of high blood osmolality that if I go have a sweet potato or something thereafter, am I actually really driving that pathway or? Okay, yeah, so I actually had some slides on uric acid that I had to cut, because um, <laughs> I've talked about uric acid here before, um, and one of the uh, hypotheses that I, I didn't really talk about much on that uh, talk was the blood pressure hypothesis, and, and specifically because we were in this low-sodium environment that we needed that uric acid to bring blood pressure up. But um, the other thing that I, that I went into in that talk was that uh, the idea that there are these pathways that are that are that lead toward the metabolic syndrome kind of uh, pathways don't seem to necessarily be in be relevant in the context where of a healthy metabolically um, healthy person who doesn't already have some kind of diabetes going on, and so. Well, I think it's it's true that especially in someone who's already on the path to diabetes, that that polyol, uh, the fructose generating pathway, would become triggered. I'm not necessarily worried about it in someone who is otherwise healthy. Awesome. Cool.